All right, here we are. Lessons from the Kings, Ancient Wisdom for Modern Times. This is lesson number 10 in the series. And this lesson is entitled, The Life and Times of Hezekiah. And I'm going to do a couple of lessons about King Hezekiah, so this will be part one. As I say, uh, this will be actually a three-part study uh, of who the, the Bible describes as the greatest of the kings of the divided kingdom era. And of course, that would be King uh, Hezekiah. Let's take a look at some of the background uh, about King uh, Hezekiah. I think we're familiar with this time, but just, just give me a moment to review it. Uh, after the reign of Solomon, the third king of the United uh, Kingdom, um, there was a civil war and uh, the kingdom was divided into two, the northern kingdom, the southern kingdoms, each with their own kings. Uh, the north had um, uh, eventually been conquered by the Assyrians who were now threatening the security of the southern kingdom. Uh, the southern kingdom was actually surrounded uh, by strong world empires, Egypt uh, to the south, uh, the Assyrians and the Babylonians uh, to the north. Uh, the southern kingdom was small, it was weak, um, it was unfaithful, which was the most dangerous thing for them. Uh, it was the absolute worst time in history of that nation to become king. And so it was at this particular time in history that Hezekiah became the ruler of the southern kingdom of Judah, when it was at its lowest point in its history. So the next couple of lessons will chronicle the life of Hezekiah, hopefully draw some useful and encouraging lessons, useful and encouraging things. Hezekiah himself, his father was Ahaz, and Ahaz was an evil king who brought a lot of trouble uh, to, the, uh, to the kingdom of Judah. Ahaz had uh, two main, pro he had a lot of problems, but two main problems. One, he refused the advice of the prophets to trust in the Lord, and he relied on treaties that he formed with other nations to keep the country safe. Pretty much like what we do today, right? There's NATO and different types of alliances that nations have. You know, if someone attacks us, well then everybody joins in to counterattack. Well, this is what the Ahaz had done. He had made alliances to, you know, to safeguard his kingdom. But remember, his kingdom was a theocracy. God was the king. He simply ruled you know, according to God's will and he, uh, he was not a faithful man. Uh, his treaty with Assyria to protect him from the northern kingdoms and Syria uh, cost the nation much of its wealth over a century, a hundred years of payoffs. You know, we think, boy, are we ever living, you know, since 9-11, you know, terrorism is the big problem and so on and so forth. You know, and that's been going on for you know, 10, 15 years. They had a century where they were paying off another nation just to kind of keep them safe. They were bankrupting the southern uh, kingdom. And ultimately, um, it didn't help because Assyria turned on Judah eventually and attacked it anyways. So the people they were paying off, you know, thank you very much, have you given us all your wealth? Good, now's the time to attack because there's nothing left. Uh, so that's the first problem. The second, Ahaz, a second problem is that he was an idolater. Uh, he placed an Assyrian type altar in the temple. He used the original temple altar for divination purposes uh, he even closed the temple and the sanctuary for regular worship to God. Uh, despite warnings from Isaiah the prophet, he continued in this type, of, uh, this type of activity. Now Ahaz became king in 735 BC. 13 years later in 722 BC, the northern kingdom fell to the Assyrians. And so Ahaz continued to reign in the southern kingdom beyond that time for another six years and he died in 716 BC. Uh, this is the year that Hezekiah, his son, took over um, the control of the country. And at the time, Hezekiah was 25 years old, relatively young man. Unlike his father, however, Hezekiah was determined to turn the people back to the worship and the service of the Lord. 
Now there are many references to Hezekiah in the Old Testament, but information about him is contained mainly in three areas, uh, in 2 Kings chapter 16 to 21, 2 Chronicles chapters 28 to 33, and then in the book of Isaiah 36 to, 36 to 39. <clears throat> now these passages here, they don't list all of the activities of Hezekiah, all the details of his life in chronological order. However, they do give us the three main events recorded by the Old Testament writers. So three main events that we see in his life uh, focused on. First, uh, the reform of the nation, all the reforms that he carried on. Uh, secondly, his response to the Assyrian threat. And then the third uh, you know, installment, third you know, focus of uh, written history about him is the, his restoration from a terminal uh, illness and what took place. So today, as I said, we're going to do three lessons on Hezekiah. Today we're going to review Hezekiah's period of reform. Now, it's interesting to note that despite the potential and financial mess that Judah was in, the very first effort made was to restore the moral and spiritual life of the nation. You know, I'm always amazed at how things don't change, right? Every time you know, we have an election, and it was the same in Canada. You know, when I lived in Canada, you could interchange the headlines. Every time a new government finally took over, one of the first pronouncements that the new prime minister in Canada, it would be a prime minister, not a president, one of the very first pronouncements that the new prime minister would say is the following. Well, we didn't know what a mess the country, we just had no idea what a mess the former administration left us, so therefore all those promises we made, sorry, those are off the table, we can't afford to do any of those things. <laughs> so it's the same here. The, you know, his father dies, he, he ascends to king, and, and what's the, what is he looking at? A mess. Everything's a mess, politically, militarily, economically, morally, spiritually, everything is a mess. But what's the first thing he tackles? He tackles the moral and spiritual mess first. So this restoration effort was described in two places, in 2 Kings and in 2 Chronicles. Now in 2 Kings, it gives us a, a kind of a general summary of Hezekiah's reforms. And in 2 Chronicle, 2 Chronicle provides a more detailed account of his work with the temple and the priests and the attempts to build religious unity among the people. So let's go to 2 Kings. If you follow along in your Bible, that's fine. It's up on the screen. For you people who enjoy sitting further back, you have some new technology back there to help out. So let's go to 2 Kings, shall we? Verses one to three. It says, now it came about in the third year of Hoshea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old when he became the king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abi, the daughter of Zechariah. He did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. Notice he said his father David. Well, we know that his you know, physical father wasn't David, it was Ahaz, the evil king. But his father, his spiritual father, the one he took after, was, was David. And so in verse one to three, summarizes really just a summary account of his life and background. Uh, a judgment on his reign is given at the very beginning. And it is a favorable one comparing him to David and declaring that he was righteous in the sight of the Lord. Now, Zechariah here is not the prophet who lived later on. Abi or Abijah means God is my father. And so this suggests that his religious influence came from his mother, because we know it didn't come from his father. His father was evil, he was an idolater, so on and so forth. So again, you know, I want to point out how important it is uh, for, of course, both parents to see to the religious and spiritual education of children, but sometimes just because your partner, your, your spouse, whatever, may not be a Christian, may not be faithful, doesn't mean that you who are faithful cannot have a, a, a strong impact on your children. Because here we see in the face of you know, terrible evil and so on and so forth, this woman, we only, she's only mentioned here, this woman had a tremendous impact 
on, uh, on, her, on her son. So we keep reading verse four. It says, he removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down the Asherah. He also broke in pieces the bronze serpent that Moses had made. For until those days, the sons of Israel burned incense to it and it was called Nathushtan. So the writer you know, describes some of the things that Hezekiah began to do in order to begin his reform. Now, before establishing the good, you've got a clean house. And this is exactly what he, uh, what he did, and he did it rigorously. Judah was in the grips of idolatry, so this is what he actually started to do first. So some of the things, let's break it down a little. Uh, removal of the high places. These were altars that were in the hills and the mountains where sacrifices were offered to pagan gods. Remember, the law said the only place you can offer sacrifice is where? Well, it's in Jerusalem, it's at the temple, it's through the priest, that's the official. Uh, so people were kind of branching out on their own, making their own altars, sacrificing, even if they were sacrificing to Jehovah God, but doing it up in the mountains and up in the hills, even this was a violation. That, you know, the, no, they weren't allowed to offer sacrifice on their own. The priests were the ones. Uh, the removal of the Asherah poles. Asherah poles were wooden poles representing female deities. Both these and high places represented leftovers from Canaanite religion, from the Canaanite religion which had remained. Why? Because the Jews had failed to completely cleanse the land of these when they first arrived. And the warning was if you don't cleanse, you know, if you don't completely drive them out or wipe them out and so on and so forth, these are going to come back and, and, and hurt you. And we see uh, in the days of Ahaz, uh, you know, hundreds of years removed, uh, the fact that they didn't do the right thing to begin with uh, caused uh, this type of practice to uh, continue well into the reign of Hezekiah. Also destroyed the Nehushtan. Uh, we know the story in Numbers 21, eight and nine, there's a, an account of the Israelites, they're in the desert. Uh, they're complaining, they're whining, they're moaning, and so God sends poisonous serpents uh, among the camp. Some people are, are bitten by these, they're ill, so on and so forth. They cry out to Moses for help. Moses cries out to God, and, um, and so God tells him to fashion a bronze serpent, put it up on a pole, and the people who come and look at the pole, you know, ask for help on the pole, they'll be healed. Now, what was healing them? The pole, the serpent? No, of course not. What was healing them is that they obeyed what God said. It was an act of faith. You know, we see throughout the Bible, there are always acts of faith. You know? uh, building Noah's boat, you know, that was an act of faith. Circumcision, that was an act of faith. Baptism, New Testament, act of faith. These are all acts of faith, all right? And so um, when people, as I say, looked at the snake, they were healed of the snake bites. Now the Jews had kept this bronze snake over the centuries, but had begun to worship it as an idol. Okay. And so Hezekiah destroyed this uh, object. And so today we have that same sort of symbol, what? For, for medicine, right? For doctors uh, have that a similar uh, symbol. So this type of action seems easy enough for us. Uh, you know, so what? He, he knocked down a few altars, he, he cut down the poles, he got rid of this thing. What's the big deal? You know, no, you know, it doesn't sound like a, a revival to me. But you have to remember for a new king, 25 year old king, this was pretty risky because he was not only destroying the images and the icons and the altars that were important to the people, he was also saying to them that they had been wrong in doing this. Boy, is that a way to get popularity. <laughs> you, know, you start your reign by telling everybody they're wrong, by destroying all the religious symbols and icons and you know, uh, enablers that they have uh, used for, for decades. You know. So it takes courage you know, to confront the nation and go against its traditions and practices because they're wrong. I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if all of our leaders were like that? You know? City, state, federal, our leaders wanted to do what was right. We can always pray for that, right? So let's, let's keep praying for that. All right, so we keep reading verse five. It says, he trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. So this is the, 
passage here that declares that Hezekiah was the greatest of the kings of the, of the uh, divided era. The Holy Spirit, of course, pays him a high honor, declaring him the greatest of all the kings of the southern kings and greater than any of his contemporaries as well as those um, kings in the north. Um, the human author of this, we, we're not sure who wrote this, probably a contemporary of Jeremiah. So let's keep reading, verse six. There we go, verse six. It says, for he clung to the Lord. He did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. So he explains that what he did, he did because he trusted in the Lord. You need to trust God. When you go against the grain and you're going to you know, stir up the wrath of the people, you, you better be doing it because you're trusting God and hoping that God will protect you and help you uh, in, that, uh, in that task. So he did this, he defended what he did by citing God's word, the word that, uh, that existed. Not a special revelation. He didn't say, I got, a, I got a vision in the night and so this is why I'm doing this. No, no, he cited the written word that already existed. In other words, most revivals, what are they? Well, they're back to the Bible revivals, aren't they? Let's go back to the word. Let's go back to what God wants us to do, what God has told us to do in his word. So nothing different here. So his reform was based on God's word, not a private vision known only to himself. We continue to read verse seven and eight. It says, and the Lord was with him wherever he went, he prospered and he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. He defeated the Philistines as far as Gaza and its territory from watchtower to fortified city. So what happened? Uh, well, what happened is that God you know, blessed, his, uh, blessed his efforts. The finances of the nation began to prosper. You know, the Lord can bless you financially, not always, but He can, for spiritual reasons. You, know, you do the right thing spiritually, many times the, 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 the reward is some sort of physical thing. Not always, doesn't, you know, there's not necessarily that, you know, that, that balance there, but sometimes. They also managed to break off 100 years of domination by Assyria. And this is explained a little bit later on, how it was done and uh, what were the results of this, but in this particular uh, book he just mentions it in passing. And they defeated their age-old enemy, the Philistines, who took advantage of their past financial and spiritual weakness to attack and plunder them. Uh, and notice in Gaza, isn't, the same, isn't it amazing about history? Where, the, where are the Palestinians? They're in Gaza. What are they doing? They're con constantly attacking you know, modern, day, modern day Israel, so things haven't changed a whole lot. Although his reforms were risky and uh, demanded great changes, uh, they were successful and God blessed him because of the things that he did. All right, so now if we go to Second Chronicles, the writers not only give more details about the reforms done by Hezekiah, they also focus in on the reforms affected, uh, or how the reforms rather, affected the areas of the temple worship and, uh, and national unity. So let's go over to chapter 29, Chronicles 29, or Second Chronicles, excuse me, 29 verses three to 11, so let's read that. It says, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. He brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them into the square on the east. Then he said to them, listen to me, O Levites, consecrate yourself now and consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your fathers, and carry the uncleanness out from the holy, uh, holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful and have done evil in the sight of the Lord our God and have forsaken Him and turned their faces away from the dwelling place of the Lord and have turned their backs. They have also shut the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. Therefore the wrath of the Lord was against Judah and Jerusalem and He has made them an object of terror, of horror and of hissing as you see with your own eyes. For behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. Now it is time in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that His burning anger may turn away from us. My sons, do not be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before Him, to minister to Him, and to be His ministers and burn incense. So Hezekiah groups the priests and the, 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 the Levites 
and he appeals to them to repair and to cleanse the temple and themselves and renew worship. In other words, they weren't worshiping. There was no activity at the temple. So let's clean house. Let's go in the temple. Let's clean house. Let's sweep out all the old. Let's open the doors. Let's start the, you know, the, the, the regular uh, system of sacrifices. You know, let the priests personally cleanse themselves and go through all the process to make themselves worthy and ready to offer sacrifice. Let the Levites begin again their duties and, and so on and so forth. He also refers to what happened in the past as an encouragement to be restored in the Lord. And so we eventually see the Levites, you know, we see them get to work and they begin to prepare the temple, begin to prepare themselves uh, for worship. Again, don't have time to read the whole thing here. Verses 20, uh, 26 um, uh, tells us, hang on a second, I've got verse, I need to read one verse here. Uh, verse 20, I think it is, let me see. It says, then, he then King Hezekiah arose early and assembled the princes of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. So once everything was consecrated, Hezekiah invites the leaders of the city to a special worship service. The writer describes an elaborate worship service like in the days of the United Kingdom in order to rededicate the temple, rededicate the leaders and the workers of the temple, rededicate the nation back to the Lord. And so this will move us into chapter 30 uh, verses 1 to uh, 27, again, don't have time to read that. Uh, summarize that for you. Uh, once the temple and the priests were ready, Hezekiah uh, made a bold attempt to reunite the people, not on political grounds, but on spiritual grounds. So he sends messengers, not only to the cities in the southern kingdom, but he also sends messengers to the remnant of the people who lived in the northern kingdom. Remember, those were enemies in order to come and celebrate the Passover in Jerusalem. So you know, this was like a homecoming of sorts, where along with the invitation to worship together, there was an olive branch of peace for brethren who were former enemies in the northern kingdom. Now many in the north, we read, many in the north um, scoffed at the invitation, but we read that many of them you know, accepted the invitation and, and came. So we read in chapter 30, verse 12, it says, the hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart to do what the king and the princes commanded by the word of the Lord. So God provided unity to those who were willing to obey Him and obey Him through the message and through the effort of uh, Hezekiah. Again, verses 13 to 27, don't have time to read, I need to summarize that for you. So when the time for the feast came about, many had not purified or prepared themselves in the proper manner. They had forgotten. They weren't used to the rigorous uh, preparation uh, required for temple worship. You know, either because of lack of teaching or they forgotten the law, no time, no opportunity. So Hezekiah prays for them so that they could go ahead anyways. And a very rare instance, very interesting instance here, God sets aside the regulations because their heart was right and Hezekiah asked God to do this in prayer. Of course, this was the exception, not the rule. In the end, there was so much rejoicing that they decided to continue celebrating this feast for another seven days. So in verse 27, it says that God heard the prayer of the people who worshiped Him with a sincere heart, not just proper ritual. They had the ritual down. They cleaned the, you know, they cleaned the temple area and they got everything ready and the priests were dressed properly and all that. You know, all of that was done right. The ritual was correct, of course. But the heart was right as well. You, have, you gotta have both. You know, a lot of times people say, ah, ritual's not important. We don't have to do, who cares? Music, no music, you know, who cares? Well, God cares. If He didn't care, He wouldn't give us any instruction at all. He would have just said, well, you worship me any way you want. Well, okay, then worship me any way you want. One guy plays his guitar, another guy dances, you know, uh, girls, uh, you know, whatever. But he has given us instructions. He gave very, very specific and, 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 and detailed instructions to the Old Testament, which they were bound to follow. This here in, in, in this story of Hezekiah is an exception. It's not the rule. And in the New Testament, we have, you know, we have instructions how to worship God. He didn't leave us without instructions. Less instructions, 
less detail, but we have instructions nevertheless. I often tell people, what makes you think that the God who uh, you know, gave very specific detailed instruction on how He wanted to be worshiped in the Old Testament is any different from the God in the New Testament who gives other instructions? The God in the Old Testament expected people to obey those. Well, the God in the New Testament expects us to obey them as well. Nothing changed, just, just different. One thing that remains the same, right? The heart, the heart is ready. The heart needs to be, uh, the heart needs to be sincere. So God heard his prayer and so the people uh, worshiped him with a sincere heart and not just a, you know, not just a proper ritual. All right, in chapter 31, once the great feast and the rededication was complete, Hezekiah made provision so that the worship and the work of the temple could go on. He instructed the people to support the temple and the priests with their gifts. He organized the priests and the Levites so that they could account for the use of the tithes and the gifts that were brought to them. Again, in the New Testament, anything different? We have deacons that manage the money. We have, you know, we have we have uh, uh, brothers who serve the communion, who are selected, and uh, the same thing. Uh, our worship services are not as elaborate as those in the Old Testament, uh, but they're organized, right? So he instructs people to support the temple. We have the same thing, right? We pass a collection on, on Sunday uh, for gifts, uh, for offerings that the church gives. For what? Well, to continue the work of the church, not just the worship service, but everything that we everything that we do. Hezekiah also reappointed the lands and the duties to the priests and Levites so that the work of the temple would be carried out in the future in a decent and orderly way. So the story of the restoration, you know, Hezekiah's restoration, it stops here as we see that people from both, both the north and the south, the priests, the leaders, the king, all united once again and desirous of serving the Lord and we, you know, it ends on a kind of a high point, a high note. But we know, don't we, in the Old Testament, you know, it's high, low, high, low. But for Hezekiah's reign, this was a high point. His, his restoration, his revival works. People are brought together. So Hezekiah you know, has long been used as a model for revival and restoration, not only the revival and restoration of the church, but a model for personal as well as national revival. So as I'm closing out this first lesson on him, I want to share some of the basic principles of revival that we learned from Hezekiah and his times. Principles of revival in 2 Chronicles chapter 31. First uh, principle, let's read verse 20 and 21. It says, uh, thus Hezekiah did throughout all Judah and he did what was good and right and true before his Lord, uh, the Lord his God. Every work which he began in the service of the house of God, in law and in commandment, seeking his God, he did with all of his heart, and he prospered. So first law of revival, revival seeks God. It isn't the emotion and the excitement that makes or creates a revival in a person's life or in the church, even in the, even in the nation. It's not about an event, you know, the million man march. Lots of publicity, lots of shouting, lots of you know, showbiz. It isn't that that creates a revival. Revival happens where there is an honest desire to seek and find God and His will. That's when revival is happening. So it can be happening in our individual lives, the day that we say, Lord, I, you know, I, I know you're there and I know I'm yours, but somehow I'm, I feel far away from you. And I want, I'm, I'm in my heart and in my mind, I'm devoting myself to draw closer to you. That's revival. That's the beginning of revival. You know, the Bible says that God searches the hearts of those who seek Him and those who seek to do His will. So Hezekiah began with an earnest desire to find God and what God wanted, and then God led him to accomplish it. I, you know, it doesn't say it here, but I'm suspecting that Hezekiah didn't become king and have a manual for revival. 
You know, okay, well, what's the first thing on the agenda? Well, we need to get rid of those Asherah poles. Never liked those things anyways. And what does it say? I think that Hezekiah was a man of prayer. We find this out a little later on. I think that Hezekiah is a young man, again, just an opinion, but I suspect that Hezekiah, first thing he did when he got to be king, he got down on his knees and said, what am I going to do? Lord, help me. I have no money, no army, no prospects. I have nothing. Help me. And I think it's the Lord that led him. Okay, this is where you begin. And in doing so, God blessed Hezekiah. You know, he didn't change the times. He equipped Hezekiah to face the problems. You know, clear thinking and courage, prosperity, mercy, all these things given to Hezekiah in the time of, in the time of trouble. So what he needed wasn't money, you know, even though they were broke financially. What he needed wasn't 100,000 soldiers, because you know, they needed to, what he needed was to be right with God. When the leader is right with God, then the followers can be right with God. But when the leaders are not right with God, it's very hard for the followers to be right with God. We've said that many times, right? You know, the church cannot rise above its leadership. Right? It's, it's important that we become as our leaders. And that's the same for anything, a corporation, a company, a school, a nation, a state. You know? Secondly, second principle of revival. Revival requires commitment. If you remember what we read, all the altars were gone, all the Asherah poles were gone, all the pagan traditions knocked out, all the old practices removed. The entire temple cleansed, all the people encouraged to return, an all-out spectacular service, a provision for perpetual temple worship. This wasn't just a knockoff. We're going to clean things up, have a big worship service, and then just go back to doing what we were doing. No, no. He provided. You know, the, it was very important, significant, that he gave the lands back to the Levites, the priests. Why? So that they could simply focus on the work of the temple and not have to, quote, earn their living. So Hezekiah provided for the ongoing of the, of the revival. He didn't hold back. He went about restoring the temple and the worship of God with all of his heart. And a lot of times, a lot of there are a lot of resolutions you know, to do better, to grow in Christ, to change things. And usually we go nowhere with these because we don't go into it with all of our hearts. You know, we think it's okay to to say, I'm all in, you know, we're going to, I don't know, you know we, we play amateur baseball, yeah, I'm all in for the team, I'll go to every practice, you know, I'm all in. Well, you know, sometimes we have to be all in, I'm all in for the church, I'm all in. Every service, as much as I can, I'm all in. So revival requires an absolute dedication, a total removing of what is unacceptable in order to work. Revival is a fire and it spreads like fire and fire is hot, not lukewarm. And then thirdly, revival restores the word of God. The purpose of revival or restoration is to go back and do what God has told us to do in His word in the way that He's told us to do it. Revival is not inventing new stuff. Hezekiah's revival restored God's command concerning worship in the seventh century before Christ. That's what his revival was about. You know, the restoration movement of the 18th and 19th century from which the churches of Christ come, what were they? Stone, Campbell, all these people, what were they trying to do 100, 200 years ago? Well, what they were trying to do, they wanted to restore and teach only the Bible as God's word and eliminate human traditions that had crept into the practice of the church. 
Their standard was only the Bible. If it's in the Bible, let's do it. If it's in the Bible, let's figure out how the Bible wants us to do it, and let's just do it that way. And if it isn't in the Bible, if it's merely a human tradition, then let's let it go. Not a concept that is too difficult to understand. You don't have to have a doctorate in philosophy to understand that idea. Restoration has always been the same thing. Back to the Bible, back to the Word. Are we the only ones that ever had this idea in the restoration movement? Churches, of course not. <laughs> of course not. Other people have had that idea, but I, I dare say in the modern era, we've been the most successful with that idea. See what I'm saying? We're not the biggest, whatever, but we have been the most successful in maintaining an ongoing desire to restore only God's word in the practice of Christianity. I mean, you know, over 10,000 congregations of the Lord's Church just in the United States. As a matter of fact, you cannot count how many there are because a lot of them don't bother registering. We don't have a headquarters anywhere that counts everybody. That's where we're from, that's what we're doing. You're wondering, what is the Choctaw Church of Christ? Well, we're a group of Christians who are trying to do what the Bible says in, in Bible ways. Nothing more, nothing less. So every generation has to work at maintaining or restoring obedience and teaching to God's word. When we um, uh, uh, seek Him and His will, this is where it's going to end, this is where we're going to end up every time. Don't worry about the future generation. Don't worry about them. Just teach them God's word diligently. And, and, and they themselves, through the power of the Spirit, will seek to go back to, to God's word. So like Hezekiah, who was blessed for his revival efforts, I believe that God will also bless and has blessed all those who have sought to revive men's heart uh, to obedience to God's word. And that's what we're about. You wonder, why so many Bible classes? How come those other guys there, they don't have a Wednesday night Bible class? No, they don't have Sunday school. You know, they don't do that. They don't have a Sunday night. Why? Why do we do that? Well, we do that because we want to learn God's word. We want to be good at it. I, I didn't live through this because I became a Christian as an adult. So I didn't, in Canada, you know. But uh, in reading about the church, the history of the church, especially in the 40s and 50s, early 60s, the churches of Christ, they weren't known for the people, oh, you guys don't use instruments. Now, you know, that's what they, oh, you don't use instruments. That's not what the churches of Christ were known for back in those days. Back in the 50s and 60s and 40s and that, the churches of Christ were known, you guys are the Bible people, aren't you? You're the Bible people. Because every member could quote the scripture. Every member knew the plan of salvation. Every member could quote or could refer to a Bible passage, so on and so forth, to support what they were doing, why they were doing it. Oh, you're the Bible people. We, I don't, I, they don't say that about us anymore, that we're the Bible people. So I'm saying to you, let's revive that idea, <laughs> that we be the Bible people. Let's learn God's word, let's read God's word, let's teach each other God's word, let's be faithful to the lessons. You know, this, this auditorium should be packed, every classroom should be packed. Why? Because we're teaching God's word. It's the thing that gives us life. And it's the, the very thing that gives us an abundant life in the here and now. And certainly eternal life uh, in the time to come. Okay, well that's our first class in Hezekiah. We'll move on to part two of Hezekiah next time. Thank you for your attention.